All right, so today I wanna to show you what I consider to be the top five recessive mutations in ball pythons. And keep in mind with the recessive mutation, you actually need two copies of the gene to get a visual. So for example, this snake around my neck here, this is Bobby, my bamboo ball python. And this just has one copy of the bamboo gene. You can actually see it. Obviously, it's a really beautiful snake, if you, especially if you compare it to like a normal wild caught ball python. If you actually have two copies of the bamboo gene, you get a super, which is in this case, you'd actually get an all white snake with blue eyes with the bamboo. But with the recessive mutation, if you only have one copy of the gene, we call it a het or heterozygous for that recessive mutation. And you need two copies of the gene to actually get a visual. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna cover the top five, what I consider the top five recessive mutations that are pretty much the most popular or that have the most potential as a recessive ball python mutation. All right, so I'm gonna jump over here on morphmarket.com and I wanna start with the number one recessive ball python mutation pretty much in the history of ball pythons and that has to be the pied ball python. And the pied just as a standalone morph is probably one of the most visually stunning morphs in all of ball pythons. As a matter of fact, when people come in and look at my snakes here in my collection, especially if they're not into snakes and they don't really know the genes and the prices and the market and everything, I'm going through all my snakes and when I hit my my pods, I always hear these gasps. That is an amazing snake. And this, this snake is pretty much the one that kick-started the whole ball python industry. Was one of the ones first on the scene. I think the albino was first. Right on the heels of the albino, the pods came out and people just pretty much went crazy over ball pythons as soon as the pods hit the market. And I want to show you just a few examples of what you can do with the pied. The pods are always, it seems like they're always in high demand. A lot of people are after pied and they really hold their prices really well. And probably one of the best pied combos is when you mix pied with super black pastel and you get the panda pied. Pretty much the, the only pied combo where you can get a really dark patch that is almost inkjet black on the snake. Really awesome combo. I've seen a lot of people trying to make combos that are as black as this and let me tell you, there's nothing that really compares to the black dark spots on the panda pied, pretty awesome combo. Here's another one, this is the albino pied. Pretty common, I'd say a lot of people are after the, the albino pieds. I actually produced one albino pieds breeding two hets together. And I actually, well, I actually had a visual and then I bred it to an albino het pied and got one visual last year. And, and actually, I was gonna hold on to it, but someone actually offered me a price for it and I actually sold my female albino pied. But let me tell you, if, if you're, some people build their whole collections just on pieds. It's pretty incredible that how popular they are. Here's another one. This is the VPI Azanthic Pied. So it's the Azanthic, which pretty much wipes out all the color. And then you add it to the Pied. And you pretty much get like a black and white and gray Pied, which is pretty awesome. And the number two gene right after the pied, I'd say hands down, that has to be the clown ball python. And this is what a clown looks like. And it's kind of interesting, when I first started in ball pythons, I was kind of looking for projects to invest in. And pretty much the two most popular genes on the market today, even five years ago when I started, those were the pieds and the clowns. And I would look at the clown and I would say, why would someone buy a clown when the pieds are so much more impressive as a standalone morph? And the interesting thing is the, the clowns are actually more popular, I think, it's to a certain degree because they are the king of combos when it comes to recessive morphs. So you mix clown with other genes and it makes some amazing combos like you've never seen before. And it's, it's, it's kind of deceiving just looking at the base morph, but when you mix other genes into it, I want to show you first this one right here. This is actually a banana, inchy, orange dream, yellow belly clown. Just look at that snake. It's kind of crazy. I actually have one that looks almost like that with the banana and the Enchi and the clown. It doesn't have the orange dream or the yellow belly. And if you look at the prices on some of these clowns, this one actually sold for $7,500. Pretty crazy. Pretty crazy prices on some of these clown combos. 
Here's another one. This is the Enchi Lesser Spot Nose Clown. If you look at this one compared to the last one, compared to the base clown, they look completely different. As a matter of fact, a lot of people would probably be hard pressed to identify the clown if they weren't, you know, familiar with snakes and how to identify them. And pretty much all the clowns you can tell from these crazy head patterns. It always gives kind of a crazy head pattern. Here's another one. This is the Enchi Firefly Clown. So this is Enchi Yellow, uh, Enchi Fire and Pastel. And I was almost going to say Yellow Belly because it looks like it's bright enough to have Yellow Belly in it. It's kind of interesting. So this is this actually sold for six thousand dollars. These clown combos are pretty crazy. So here's another one I wanted to show you. This is kind of the first year I've ever seen anything like this. I actually did a morph special on mahogany. Found out for dark morphs, mahogany is pretty much the king of combos when it comes to dark morphs. And you mix that with clown, which is kind of the king of combos for recessives. And you get this wild looking snake. As a matter of fact, the thing that was really interesting is this weird kind of a head that it has. Almost looks like it's missing scales, like it's scaleless or something. It's kind of kind of an interesting interesting combo. I really like how the color and the pattern is, is, is uh, I'm kind of interested in the price on this one. This one is actually still for sale $5,000. As a matter of fact, uh, this one just posted in January 26, just a few days ago it posted, which is pretty incredible. It's, it's a really awesome combo. First time I've ever seen that. And I wouldn't mind that just to, you know, breed that into my clown. Plus, you could actually get mahogany into your collection. The only thing is, is I don't really have that kind of money right now to invest in another snake. So here's probably the, the, I would say, as far as the top recessive, this is, has to be the number three. And then the, the problem with the albino, I would say, is, is a lot of times when you mix other genes into albino, it kind of masks some. So it's, a, it's really hard to mix with other genes. But as a standalone morph, if you just take a look at the snake, and this is just so impressive as a standalone morph. As a matter of fact, I produce albinos. I produced a few, uh, I think it was last year, and then a few the year before, and it seems like they always they're the first to sell at my ta on my tables at the reptile show. It's pretty awesome morphs. And the cool thing about albinos is you see they have a really high contrast in some cases. Some cases they're not really high contrast, but some actually are where they have this really high definition between the yellows and the whites. And as they mature, a lot of times they keep that contrast. And it's, it's really awesome when you have a really big snake with that really high contrast of yellow and white. And they always have red eyes. It's kind of interesting. So talking about combos with albino, I think my favorite one is the albino tri-stripe. Works really well with tri-stripe. Tri-stripe, essentially what it does is it puts the stripe on the snake, kind of like three stripes right down the back. Not a lot of people are working with tri-stripe, and they're usually pretty expensive. This one actually sold for $6,500, mainly because of the tri-stripe. Albinos, I'd say, are pretty cheap. You know, you can pick up an albino usually for a couple hundred bucks, but you start mixing double recessives with a pretty rare gene like tristripe and it brings a pretty good price. Here's another one I thought was pretty interesting. This is actually called the Cherry Bomb, which is the Super Mojave and the Albino. So essentially what it is, is it's a blue-eyed leucistic, which is usually a white snake with blue eyes, and then you're adding Albino on top of it. And if you look at the eyes on this one, it has, it's almost confused, because it almost wants to be blue, and it almost wants to be red. It's kind of halfway in between, which is really an interesting mix. Here's another one that I thought was probably one of my favorite albino combos, and that is with the black pastel. It's kind of interesting how the black pastel works with albino. Essentially what it does is it breaks up the pattern so you see a lot more white. It really defines it a lot. Of, uh, I, I think in almost all cases, it's, it has a really high contrast between the colors of the snake. And the interesting thing is, is it takes the yellow and it turns it into an orange color. It makes for a really impressive combo. You'd think it's, you know, when I first thought of black pastel and albino, I thought it would be a little bit different. I didn't think it would have this kind of an effect. Sometimes it's kind of surprising. 
Here's another one. This is actually in a xanthic and an albino in the same snake. Two recessives, and every time you have an azanthic and an albino, we call it a snow. And a snow is probably the ultimate all-white snake with the red eyes. It's kind of an awesome combo. I, I haven't really seen a really bad snow. And it's, it's kind of interesting if you actually bred this, you could breed it to an albino, get a, more albinos, or you could breed it to an azanthic and get more azanthics. It's a really awesome combo. So here is an albino pied. We kind of covered this at the beginning. This is a really good example. I'd say most people when they're looking for pieds, they're looking for like a 50-50 mix of the different colors. This is probably the ideal albino pied. As a matter of fact, if you look at albinos over on Morph Market, pretty much the number one as far as numbers are albino pieds. It seems like almost everyone when they get into albino, they go after the albino pieds because they bring in a lot of money. They're, they're really impressive and they're really popular a lot of people are buying into the project so I wanted to jump over into my number four top morph as far as the, the top five. And I'd say this is probably in there as far as numbers over here on Morph Market. It's really, it's, it's, I'd say, Exanthic is, is, it's, it's kind of hard because there's actually different lines of Exanthic. This is actually the SK Exanthic. There's the VPI and the Jolef and the, there's a whole bunch of different lines of Exanthic. And as far as I know, none of them are compatible. So for example, you can have a VPI Azanthic, breed it to an SK Azanthic, and you get all normal looking snakes that are double head. So you really have to make sure that you have the same line of Azanthic. And essentially what Azanthic does is it wipes out all the color and you end up with a black and white and gray kind of a snake. Makes some really interesting combos. And this is probably the best over here when you actually mix it with fire and pastel in the same snake. You actually get a firefly SK Azanthic. And this one is just pretty awesome. These are actually they bring they bring in pretty good money if you get some good ones. This actually sells is selling for sold for twelve hundred dollars. And this is actually from JD Constriction. The interesting thing about JD Constriction is they specialize only in Azanthix. You know, some people specialize in clowns or pies, or maybe you do like I do, and I kind of have dabble in everything. I don't really have a specialty. And some people they just focus on one thing which is pretty awesome. Here's another one. This is actually the VPI line of a Xanthic, and it's a bumblebee. So this is actually the spider and the pastel with the a Xanthic. Makes for a really awesome combo. And no discussion of the Xanthic would be complete without mentioning the Stormtrooper. This is the Stormtrooper, and you may have heard of the Stormtrooper. It's pretty much the most famous snake in all of ball pythons, I think. It's, it's pretty awesome. As a matter of fact, when I went to my very first NARBC reptile show, I was walking through there. I was, I was brand new into ball pythons, and it's kind of funny. I was walking up to tables. I was like, what does het mean? I didn't know what heterozygous was or recessive or anything. I was like, totally brand new. And the first First thing I saw was this booth that actually had these Star Wars figurines all around the booth and I saw the Stormtrooper and I was like what in the world is a Stormtrooper and come to find out it was actually produced by JD Constriction and this is what the snake looked like when I first saw it and it looked like this on the top and the funny thing is, is it is as it aged it kind of turned into a more of a blacker snake it really brought in a lot of the blacks completely changed what the snake looks like and the really interesting thing is when he hatched this out, he didn't really know what the genes were that were in there. A lot of people, you know, kind of speculated that maybe this was actually in a Xanthic desert ghost. They weren't sure exactly what was in there. And everyone was really surprised when it actually changed from one color to another. As a matter of fact, I saw the price tag on the Stormtrooper when I walked into his booth for the first time. He actually had $50,000 on the snake and nobody, no, no, actually nobody bought it. And I think he he still brings it to the reptile shows just to kind of show it off. That is the Stormtrooper. So here is what I consider probably the number five as far as recessive mutations, and that is the Desert Ghost. The Desert Ghost is kind of interesting because as far as the numbers of snakes over on Morph Market, it's not in the top five, but I think it has the most potential to be in the top five once people really take a look at the Desert Ghost. And you don't really want to confuse this with the Desert, which is problematic with the females. That is a completely different gene. There's no problems at all with the Desert Ghost. 
Ghost. It's a really awesome morph. I actually have a couple Desert Ghosts. And, and kind of the anomaly when, when it comes to Desert Ghost is I've actually seen just the base morph of Desert Ghost look completely different from person to person. So for example, this is just a Desert Ghost. It's a recessive mutation. I've actually seen some that are quite a bit more grayed out, almost like a, a charcoal gray kind of a color. And then someone else comes along and posts this snake as a straight Desert Ghost. And then someone else comes along and posts this bright yellow snake as a Desert Ghost. So I'm thinking there are several different lines of Desert Ghost. And I'm not sure exactly how, if the different lines work differently with different genes, if you can produce different results. But I've, I've just really noticed that it seems like there are huge differences between certain lines of Desert Ghost. And people just kind of group them all together. So you really have to watch what you're getting when you buy into Desert Ghost. Here is an interesting snake. This is actually a pastel desert ghost. I actually have one of these. I have a male pastel desert ghost. And the, the cool thing about the desert ghost is if you take a look at this snake, it's it's a hatchling, has really bright colors. And a lot of morphs actually start fading as they mature. The desert ghosts actually keep the color and the contrast and the brightness as they mature. It's one of the advantages. So I've actually seen people with adults that are almost as bright as the hatchling. The cool thing about this is it's actually het vpi xanthic so you know what they're shooting for they're shooting for the stormtrooper this is what they're trying to do <laughs> it's kind of interesting and the the, the the cool thing is is this actually if you look at this right here they actually produced a vpi desert ghost this is what they're kind of showing off this the potential of what you can make and it's a, to me it was kind of disappointing to actually find this i thought for sure they were going to produce another stormtrooper and then you look at this it's like it's close i'd say it has a really high contrast between the two colors really awesome but it doesn't have the same pattern not quite the same as the stormtrooper but it's, it's pretty crazy look at this look at the price on this one this actually sold for six thousand dollars and it posted on 11 15 sold on 11 21 just a few days after it posted someone bought it for six thousand dollars going after the double recessive the azanthic desert ghost Here's another one that's pretty awesome. This is the Orange Dream Desert Ghost. And it seems like when you add Desert Ghost, it really keeps the color of the genes that's underneath. And then it really keeps them as the snake matures. So it doesn't really change colors a lot. Really gets some awesome snakes as the snake gets older. Here's another one that I thought was really awesome. This is the GHI Desert Ghost. Probably the most impressive GHI combo. GHI essentially what it is, is it really makes a crazy pattern and it's a dark morph, so it really darkens the background of the snake. Really pops out here on the Desert Ghost. Here's one that's kind of interesting. This is actually an Orange Dream Lemon Blast. So this is Orange Dream, Pastel, and Pinstripe. I can't say I've ever seen a snake that looks anything like this. Really clean. Almost looks like a pinstripe, but the lines are super clean and defined. And it looks like this one kind of has a little bit of orange. A lot of the Lemon Blasts start a little bit orange on the side and kind of lose it as they mature. But it'd be really awesome to see that snake as an adult to see if it really keeps this crazy contrast. And this one's actually sold for $3,000. That's another thing about Desert Ghost is you can make some really cool combos and you can actually make some money too on the side. It's pretty, a lot of times you have to actually spend the money to get into the project. So I actually bought a Pastel Desert Ghost male and a Bumblebee Desert Ghost female. This is actually exactly like the female that I bought and it's, it's almost breeding size now. I'm hoping that this year I'll actually get those two to breed and I'd say it faded just a little bit but it really kept a lot of the color and the contrast as it matured and the price is on this one it is a thousand dollars and I'm pretty sure I paid for about a thousand dollars for my snake a few years ago these prices are holding really well for the desert ghosts all right so it is time for the question of the day and Jack Rainier asks 
So when is ball python breeding season from start to finish? And that is a very good question. Essentially, you can breed ball pythons any time of the year, but I'd say most people usually start between October and December is when they start pairing up their snakes. And kind of the thinking behind it is most people produce hatchlings so they can sell them at the fall shows. If you're looking for a ball python hatchling, pretty much the best selection is in the fall at the reptile shows. And if you go to the reptile shows in the spring, I'd say most people have pretty much just leftovers from the year before that didn't sell. Sometimes you can get good deals in the spring. And the cool thing about shopping the reptile shows in the spring is a lot of the snakes that you're buying are hatchlings that are two or three times as large as they normally would be in the fall. A lot of times if you buy hatchlings in the fall, they're really small and just had a few meals coming out of the egg. So it really depends on what you're looking for. Probably if you're looking for the best selection, the fall is the best time to go to reptile shows. But usually what I do is I start pairing up mid October and then I'll pair up my snakes usually for about five or six months pretty much once a month I'll go through and move the males through all the females and then give them a break for a few weeks and they just do that once a month and then usually the, the eggs come over a large window of time usually in early spring you know you start getting your first eggs all the way until late summer sometimes sometimes they'll lay so late that you can't get them ready for the next year and you have to give them the following year off because you can't get enough food into them before the next season starts so that is pretty much it thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video